our, our thoughts and our plans change. And we don't know why they change. We try to put it together. But I really feel like God is involved in changing things that happen around us. So when we have things that we're doing or that are important to us, um, oftentimes right in the middle of it or right in the beginning of it, you realize this is not going to go the way you thought it was going to go. And so those changes require what? What do they require from us? Acceptance. Okay, you have to accept it, right? Yeah. That's important. Um, in order to um, accept that, you often find that you have to make a sacrifice, right? Yeah. So if you, if a, if a plan isn't working out the way you want it to, you may find that you're going to have to, you know, Set, make some changes. You're going to have to uh, sacrifice some of those thoughts and those ideas that you had in your mind about what, how this is going to go. Whether it's work, or whether it's a vacation, or whether it's something in your personal life, or maybe you're expect, uh, experiencing some challenge. Today's information is going to be, could be sensitive for you might get frustrated and you might uh, it's going to be an honest uh, look at ourselves we're going to we're going to decide to we're going to decide in our minds that we're going to try to have the mind of Christ in the subject of sacrifice so I want you to be thinking about that we're going to be looking at something Jesus himself said and I just want you to remember that if you're not willing to do some work, and you're not willing to sacrifice, um, you may not accomplish some of those things in your life that you want to accomplish. Nothing really fantastic or wonderful or great comes without it. So I want to share with you a story that... Um, that I heard. So just kind of follow through this fable. This is an old fable about an emperor. Many years ago, he gathers together the wisest people in the kingdom. The wisest people. He gathers them all together and he says to them, I want you to assemble all of the great knowledge of our civilizations so that it will be available for the future generations to all the wise people and he says you know write all this down we're going to fast forward this to other civilizations give them a heads up on what's you know um, what's great knowledge and we can pass this great knowledge on they worked on this for years uh, before returning with ten bound volumes uh, volumes and volumes of, of knowledge so the emperor, he glances at this stack of books uh, and he says, no, that's not going to work. There's too much stuff. There's too much there. So the sages scurried back to work and, and they did not return until they had edited all those volumes and volumes and volumes of work. And when they handed it, edited to the emperor, he again refused to open it and he said, it's too lengthy. Over the next two years, the sages condensed the book into one paragraph. They took it to the emperor. This, uh, this, this valuable knowledge, they took it one paragraph to the emperor, and the emperor, he wasn't still satisfied. Finally, the wise people came back with a single sentence inscribed on it in an index card, and this is what it said. The emperor read it, and he smiled, and he said, that's perfect. Future generations will understand why we've been so successful. All the geniuses, the genius we possess is contained right here, he said. And the sentence simply said, there is no free lunch. Why was that phrase so important in this story? Any 
Thoughts on that? There's no free lunch. What do they mean, uh, Christina? Um, that nothing for free. Sacrifice something. Right along with our subject, right? Nothing's for free. The truth is, whether you eat dog food or you're eating steak, whatever it is, uh, depends on how high a price you're going to pay for the meal. In other words, greatness depends on payment. Greatness depends on sacrifice. Sacrifice is what Jesus is speaking of in the passage we're going to study today, uh, together. We're going to study it. And I hope God does a miracle in our hearts. In fact, uh, in, a, in a sermonic form, Jesus, first of all, gives an explanation of sacrifice. Then he gives an illustration of sacrifice. And then he makes an application of sacrifice. So I want you to be thinking about how this applies to you and me. Sometimes making a sacrifice is hard. And sometimes it requires a different mindset. So hopefully today in our discussion, if you're watching this or you're here, that uh, God will do something in our hearts and open our hearts to realize that if we really want to accomplish something great in our life, we've got to be willing to sacrifice and to work hard because nothing is free. So let's open our Bibles. Let's get right in the, in the, in the verses. Luke chapter 14. We're going to begin reading in verse 25. Luke chapter 14 and verse 25. We're going to be reading a few verses here. Luke chapter 14 and verse 25. And what I'd like to do is read all the verses. I want you to see how Jesus makes an application of sacrifice. Luke chapter 14 and verse 25. And this is how discipleship is tested. And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, so he turns to the crowd. And he says, If any man comes to me and hates not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Verse 28. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he has sufficient to finish it? Lest perhaps after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build, he was not able to finish. Or what king? going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first, and consulteth whether is able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand. Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an embassy and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, Whosoever he is of you that forsaketh not all that he hath cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its savor, with what shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land, nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Those are the words. Verse 25, Jesus is speaking to a multitude. He's not just speaking to just his core followers. He's speaking to everyone. And that's what we want these words to ring out to today. Whether you've accepted Jesus in your life or whether you're someone who's, you know, browsing the video and you're watching online uh, and, you're, and, you're, and you're maybe uh, this is uh, new news for you or you're not quite a believer. To the multitudes he speaks. 
We would call this crowd today maybe groupies. They're curious. Three different times in this passage, uh, Jesus said, unless you meet certain conditions, you can't do what? Unless you, you don't do this, you can't do what? Huh? Okay. You can't. Okay. Right? Or be what? You can't come and be a disciple. Right? Over and over he said this uh, in these verses. All right. Okay. Unless you meet this condition, you cannot be my disciples. Quite frankly, Jesus was trying to thin out the crowd. How would that thin out the crowd? If Jesus said, okay, I, I'm going to just lay this out here. All of you are following me. I see all of you. But unless you do this and this and this, you can't be a disciple. How would that thin the crowd out? Think about it. If you were there listening, who might be thinned out? Your thoughts? A lot of people, right? Yeah, a lot of people, like all the okay. Sinners would be, right? Because the sacrifice is to put Jesus first, to love him more than anything, right? It might be hard for people who are workaholics to put Jesus first. Because in their mind, maybe they're somewhere else mentally. They're not willing to put Jesus in the first spot. It could be a lot of different people. And Jesus is, you know, he's trying to thin out this crowd, thin out the ranks. Unlike the uh, modern day church, Jesus was not looking for a crowd. Get that point? Jesus wasn't looking for just this multitude. That's what, not what his purpose was. He was looking for what? Followers. Followers. He wasn't looking for just a crowd of people to come in, right? That'd be a famous church in the middle of town where everybody gathered. He was looking for commitment. He was looking for followers, that believers. That's what Jesus wanted, and that's what was important to Jesus. He was not looking for decisions. He was looking for disciples. And uh, though we rarely refer to Christians today as disciples, the word disciple was the most common name used for followers of Jesus. In fact, the gospel in the book of Acts in that, uh, in the Gospels, the Book of Acts, Christians are called disciples 264 times. Disciples, those were the Christians. Okay, what Jesus teaches in this passage about being a disciple is exactly the same lessons we have to learn today. You say, well, what's that lesson? If you are going to achieve greatness, greatness either individually or together as a church, you need to realize that nothing great ever happens without sacrifice. Nothing great is going to come without sacrifice. Sacrifice involves four key actions, all of which together guarantee greatness. One, there's a decision. Must be determined. Jesus says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, uh, and his own wife, he cannot be my disciple. The verse has caused a lot of people a lot of unnecessary grief. Because it appears as if Jesus is telling them that they should hate the ones they should love the most. But that is not what Jesus is saying. That's not what he means. The same Jesus who tells us to love our enemies would definitely not turn around and then say, you know, love your enemies but hate your family. It's not what Jesus would do. Uh, in this particular verse, uh, the old adage would be true. Everything is relative. So what Jesus meant, the word hate here really has the meaning of loving less. Loving less. The real sense of this verse is found in Matthew 10, 37, where Jesus says, uh, He who loves father or mo mother 
more than me is not worthy of me. And that's what the essence of what we're reading here in Luke. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. One of the reasons why Jesus said this to this crowd was this. 2,000 years ago, if you gave your life to Jesus, you most likely would have to give up your family. Especially if you were Jewish. Even today, in certain countries, like in some Muslim countries, if a Muslim converts to a Christian, converts to Christ, he is immediately disowned by his family, and oftentimes he's put under the curse of death. So Jesus makes this demand because he's dealing with the question of priority. If you are going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, he has to be your first love. He will not take second place to anyone or anything. Okay? He has to be your first love. That's going to bother a few people that are watching this. It may bother you. Because uh, there's things that we love. There's things in our lives that you say, you know, the most important thing to me is this. And we forget about Jesus. Jesus is saying he's got to be number one. And that means sacrifice. But you can have a number two. Right? If you want. But Jesus really has to be number one. The priority. If you're going to be his follower, he's got to be your first. He's not going to take second place. Can you uh, imagine if you're uh, a sister here, or you're watching, if you're a lady? Can you imagine if, if a man proposed to you, and he said, I, I, want, I, want, I want you to marry me under one condition. If down the road, another woman comes into my life that I like, and, and maybe I like her more than you, uh, so you're going to, you know, if that happens, you're going to have to go. Okay? How would that how do you feel about that? Forget it. Forget it. Okay. Forget it. You imagine. Um, yeah, you'll have to leave. Do you think there's a woman on earth that would accept that type of proposal? Probably not. Right? No woman should accept that because whenever a man marries a woman, that woman deserves to be the number one in his life. The only woman in his life. That's the decision that was made when they got married. Anything you put above the Lord Jesus Christ becomes your Lord. And He demands to be the only Lord in your life if you put kind of the same rules and apply them to your relationship with Christ. Um, I read about a South Baptist uh, uh, leader uh, who was a great preacher uh, and he proposed to his wife and this is what he said to her. How would you like to hear this proposal? This is what he said to his wife, sweetheart, before they were married. Would you be willing to take second place in my life for the rest of your life? Would you be willing to take second place in my life for the rest of your life? In other words, he was saying to her, if you're willing to be second to Jesus, then we can get married. Because Jesus will always be my number one. That's a pretty good proposal, right? Yeah. There is a sacrifice you must make to take even the first step towards Jesus Christ. He must come first. That's the first sacrifice. That is a sacrifice ahead of family, ahead of friends, ahead of finances. That is a sacrifice that you're going to have to make if you're going to be a disciple of Jesus. Number two, there is a price that you will pay. Right? If you want anything great, you have to pay a price. It could be in the form of work. It could be your studies. Can you think of anything else you'd have to pay? I mean, if you accomplish something great, what would you have to do first? Can you think? If you were going to be a painter, and accomplish great works of art, what would you have to do first? Practice. You'd have to practice, right? Blood, sweat, and tears. You'd have to practice. You'd have to put your time in. You'd have to learn some different techniques. Do your homework. Do your homework. You might watch some videos, right? 
You might even take some classes. You try to learn. You take as much in. There would be a price for you because if you did that, what would you put up? What would you not be able to do? Maybe you might not be able to work as much. You might not make as much money because now you're an artist. So you're putting all your time at this. You're making a sacrifice. It's a cost. It's starting to cost you your sacrifice. There is a price that must be paid if you're a disciple of Jesus. Whoever does not bear his cross, this is what Jesus says, and come after me, cannot be my disciple. Uh, I want to emphasize that although salvation is free, it's not going to be cheap. Just as Jesus paid a price in order to save you, you have to pay a price in order to serve him. And maybe that just shut you down, thinking that you've got to pay to serve Jesus. I want you to think about this right in your mind. I just want you to think, give this thought. The fact of the matter is, it not only pays to serve Jesus, it's going to cost to serve Jesus. It's going to cost you. That may turn you off, uh, but as a matter of fact, I, I, I think it will turn some people off. It turned a lot of people off in Jesus' day when Jesus said that. It turned them off. One famous pastor, Billy Graham, once said something that I agree with. This is what he said. I think the main reason people did not come to Christ is because they didn't want to pay the price. But Christ will not compromise. And He will not negotiate. There is a price. If you're going to be a disciple and you're going to take Jesus on in your life, there's a price. Today, we would talk about the electric chair or the gas chamber because a cross was a symbol of a one, a, a one thing. Uh, it was a symbol of what? The cross, back in Bible times, was a symbol of, right? Death. Right? It was a symbol of death. There was only one reason that a man would take up a cross, and that is because he was going to die. That's why he goes on to say in verse 26 that you must love him more than your own life. You'd be willing to die for Jesus. You'd be willing to take up the cross, right? If you're going to be a disciple, then your number one ambition is to fulfill uh, whatever his ambition is for you in your life. You know what it is. And you know what challenges you are to face it. You know what's going to stand in your way. You know what Jesus wants from you. He's already been talking to you. You know what it is. You know what his ambition is. And your number one priority should be to fulfill it. The cross always comes before commitment. The cross always comes before the crown. Jesus made it plain. If you're not willing to die for your, to yourself, die to yourself. Alright? If you're not willing to do it to your ambitions, if you're not willing to die to your ambitions, your goals, your desires, and surrender your life totally to Him, you cannot be a disciple. How many great missionary men have traveled the world and shared the gospel message and sacrificed uh, families, time, right? Their goals, money, right? Things that they wanted to accomplish in their mind, but they spent their whole uh, lives until the end of this life. They spent it all. They sacrificed. Like Pastor Ron. Like if you want to win a popularity contest in this world, don't even bother. Don't bother. That's what's important to you. The world mocked him and it's going to mock you. The world scorned him and it's going to scorn you. The world rejected him and it's going to reject you. This is a small price to pay, really, really, right? When you consider the benefit of becoming His disciple and living for Him and with Him for all of eternity. 
Does it seem like a big thing now? Good. Because sacrifices are huge to us. But if we don't see the big picture, then it really narrows our view, doesn't it? And it'll affect our worship to God. We're talking about an eternity living for Him and with Him. There was once a, a great prayer warrior Christian who said, uh, who asked the question of, of a great man, and he said, what is the secret of your great life? And the man responded and said, there was a day when I died. There was a day when I died. So just follow that. Um, so the man says there was a day when I died. Does anybody have any idea what he might have meant by that? He renewed himself. Okay. When he took Jesus in his heart. He owed him died and then he Right. Is that what you were thinking? Yeah. So he took on a new life and, and his old life died. Uh, he was willing to make a sacrifice in order to please the Lord Jesus and to be his follower. <laughs> Okay, price. You go back and you study anything that's ever been achieved. Anything that's ever been achieved. Can you think of something that's great that's been achieved? How about electricity? Right? Anything that's anything that's really truly great. Uh, I I think that uh, toaster is great. Yeah, I love toast. Anything. You know what I mean? Microwave. Anything that's great. An organization could be great, right? A group of people could come forward and say, you know what, we need we need to make an organization to help uh, the homeless or battered women, right? And that becomes great. But anything that becomes great, anything that you think of that has ever been achieved of any notoriety whatsoever, and you're going to find somewhere, someplace, somehow, Somebody paid a price and somebody made a sacrifice. We live in a free country called the United States of America today because founding fathers made a sacrifice and it was a heavy price. A heavy price. These are some things that maybe you didn't know. <clears throat> the Declaration of Independence is the birth certificate of the United States of America, right? How many signers did it take for the Declaration of Independence? 56 signers. 56 signers. For this, you know, birth certificate of the United States. The 56 signers of the Declaration made a bold promise to each other. When they signed the great document, this, this Declaration, they pledged our lives our fortune and sacred honor. Were those empty words for them? We're going to make a correlation of that to where we are with Christ. But <clears throat> of those 56 courageous men who signed that document, sacrifice and price, five were captured by the British and tortured before they died. Nine died in the war, either from hardships or bullets. Twelve had their homes sacked, looted, burned, and occupied by the enemy. Two lost their sons in battle. One had two sons captured. The plantations of Georgia signers, Lindman Hall and Button Gwinnett, were destroyed as were the homes of William Ellery, George Clymer, William Floyd. William Hooper. The plantations of Edward Rutledge, Arthur Middleton, and Thomas Hayward were burned to the ground. These men from South Carolina also became prisoners of war. The family and livestock of John Hart of New Jersey were destroyed. 
His wife died trying to avoid capture, and his health was ruined. One of New York signers, Francis Lewis, not only had his home burned to the ground, but his wife was made a prisoner of war. Shortly after her release, she died. Richard Stockton, another signer, was captured, made a prisoner of war, lost his health, came back to find his home burned. And because under pressure he had signed an amnesty declaration, his family and his friends shunned him for the rest of his life. Not only is this country here because of that sacrifice for those, but the church is here also because of sacrifice. Great things come with cost and sacrifice. The church is here today because 11 disciples obeyed the command of Jesus to go into all the world to make other disciples. But consider what happened to them. I want you to think. Sacrifice and cost, price. James, the brother of Jesus, and James, the son of Zebedee, were killed by mobs in Jerusalem. Matthew was run through with a sword in Ethiopia. Philip was hanged in Greece. Bartholomew was slain alive in, the, in Ar Armenia. Andrew was crucified in Achaia, and Thomas was killed with a lance in East India. Thaddeus was shot with arrows. Simon the Zealot was crucified by the Persians. Peter was crucified upside down by the Romans. The Apostle John died alone at the island of Patmos. Greatness means there is a price to be paid. Always has meant it. And it's always going to mean it. And it's going to mean it for you. So the cost has to be counted. There are two statements that may sound contradictory to you, but they are really complementary to you. The first statement is this. The way to heaven is easy because the way to heaven is Jesus. And Jesus said, my yoke is easy. Isn't that a nice statement? Here's the next statement. Jesus now also says, Jesus is no easy way to heaven. There's a demand to discipleship. Jesus exhorts this crowd to really think it through before they decide it. Before they decide they want to make a commitment to him because there's a cost to be counted. We're not trying to, we're not trying to uh, just bring people in. We're trying to help people to understand what's at stake. Just like Jesus who wasn't so concerned with the multitudes. He wanted commitment. And he wanted believers just like you. You know, too often we worry about the price of something when we ought to consider the cost of something. Right? Let me give you an example. There's a big difference between price and cost. You take $100,000 Mercedes. And through the price, though the price is the same for everybody, the cost is different. For example, uh, you know, for Donald Trump, that might be nothing. $100,000 for savings. But for us, that's a lot, right? That cost is impossible. Likewise, there's a cost to be counted if you're going to follow the Lord Jesus. Jesus illustrates the consideration in two parables in the verses that we read. Verse 28, he says, For which of you, building a tower, doesn't sit first and calculate the cost to finish? The Christian life is a strong tower. It's going to be a tower of work. It's going to be a, a tower of worship and a tower of witness, a tower of warfare, just like our last song. We fight. But there is a tremendous cost in building the tower. Okay, the cost. Do you know why so many Christians drop out of church? You're probably thinking it in your mind. Like a lot of reasons, right? They don't see a change. Okay. Right? Is your mind working? Why 
why so many fall away, disappear, it's because they never counted the cost. Jesus points out why the hordes of hell and the hypocrites of this world laugh at, mock, and criticize the church. Lest after he has led the foundation, according to the verses we read, and he is not able to finish it, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. The number one problem with a lot of church members is that they are is that they are half finished, right? They're half finished. They're like half finished towers. They never finished building on themselves. They never really gave it what it would take to be a disciple, to weather it and stick it out. Their foundation is lacking. That's one number one problem. They're half finished. How many people do you know that ran one lap of the Christian life and quit? How many people do you know? A lot, right? We know someone. They made it a lap. They're half finished, that foundation. Or they fought one round and quit. Or they played one quarter of the game and they quit. If you are not careful, you're going to wind up half finished in your tower. Think about what Jesus said. And I, you know, I think we've talked about this before, that no matter uh, what matters in a race is not how fast you start, but how strong you finish. Sometimes we come in with a whirlwind to Christ, but we never finish our tower, and we never finish. Uh, nothing breaks my heart more than to look at Christians who used to be here and they used to do something. Uh, they used to tithe. They used to be soul winners. They used to work in the church. They used to say, magically, a used to Christian is kind of a used up town. And then Jesus goes on. It's just good to kind of look at ourselves like this. I mean, this is what this is from Jesus. We're not making this up. This is from Jesus, and he's given us these things to think about. Jesus then gives the parable. What king going to make a war against another king does not sit down first, consider whether he's able with 10,000 to take on 20,000? Who doesn't figure that out if you're going to war? Do I have what it takes? Can I confront them? Where do I set up? Do I have enough men? The Christian life is not a frolic. It is a fight. It is a war. We are soldiers of the cross. Oh, you're a soldier. In this army, there can be no cowards. The odds are great. Do you see here that the king was facing odds or from two to one, right? He's facing great odds against them, like 10,000 against 20,000. We face odds today that are unreal in our world. The world, the flesh. The devil uses against us. But that it should not discourage us because God plus one is the majority. If you have God, you have everything you need. We must be people of courage who will make the sacrifice to face any fear and fight any foe knowing that Jesus cannot lose. And I just want to add this. Really, you can't be a coward and be a disciple. You can't be a coward. You can't be a compromiser and a disciple. Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. We have been called to be soldiers and not diplomats. We fight. The average Christian wants to be just godly enough. Just godly enough. The average Christian. Are you average? Uh, the 
the average Christian wants to be godly enough to be accepted by the Lord, but worldly enough to be accepted by the world. Are you average? That's why Jesus ended in verse 33, So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. To say hello to Jesus means to say goodbye to what? If you're going to say, you're right, Jesus, I'm yours. What are you also saying goodbye to? The world. The world. That doesn't mean you can't enjoy things. That doesn't mean you can't have fun. That doesn't mean that you don't have families you love. It doesn't take away your joy. But you need to understand that if you say hello to Jesus, you're saying goodbye to the world. Uh, let me see here. I want to share this story with you. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and share this story with you before we close. There's a story uh, that I read about uh, a Hartfield International who was worried about missing his plane. He had no wristwatch and he couldn't locate a clock. So he hurried up to a total stranger, probably at the airport, and he said, Excuse me, could you give me the time? To a total stranger. The stranger smiled and he said, Sure can. And he, and he sat down two large suitcases he was carrying and he looked at his watch and he said, It is exactly 5.09. The temperature outside is 73 degrees and it's supposed to rain tonight. In London, the sky is clear and the temperature is 46 degrees. The barometer reading there is 29.14 and falling. And in Singapore, the sun is shining bright and it's 81 degrees. By the way, the moon should be full tonight as you fly out of Atlanta. So the man interrupted him and said, You mean to tell me if you're watch, that watch right there you're wearing tells you all that? And the man said, Oh yeah, tells me more than that. You see, I've invented this watch. And there's no watch like it in the world. It can tell you anything you want. In fact, it'll tell you what Wall Street's doing. It'll give you an individual stock price. It keeps up to 5,000 names, addresses, phone numbers with just a batch, a touch of a button. You can send an email on the internet and do your business. The man said, wow, that's, that's unbelievable. I love the watch. He said, well, I'll give it. He says, I'll give, it, I'll give you 5,000. Give me the watch. I'll, I'll pay you right now. I want the watch. The stranger reaches down, he picks up his big suitcases, and he said, ah, no, it's not for sale, man. Wait a minute. He says, I'll pay you 10000 for the watch. The man says, ah, you know, I can't really sell it. I plan to give it to my son for his 21st birthday. And I, and I invented it for him, really, to enjoy. The man said, listen, I'll give you $50,000 for the watch right now, right here it is. Here's the money. The stranger pauses for a minute. Okay. And he takes the $50,000. The man's elated. And he pays the stranger. Took the watch, snapped it out of his wrist, and he's happy. And the man says, by the way, you're going to need these. And he hands the man the two heavy suitcases he'll have to carry. Everywhere. And he says, don't forget, they need that. Some things that look great have a cost. Don't get the idea that sacrifice is negative, it's positive. The football team that sacrifices on the practice field and the weight room wears the championship ring. The athletic, uh, the athlete that sacrifices on the practice field and track wins the medal. No sacrifice could ever, you could ever make for Jesus could compare to the reward you will be, you will get from making it. I want to make that clear. Okay, we're going to, and we're working towards the end here. Uh, Jesus says to his disciples, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house, brother, sister's father, or mother, or child, or wife. Or lands for my sake and the gospels who will not receive what a hundredfold right now in this time and uh, and sisters in 
mothers, children, and lands, and persecutions, and in the age to come, meaning eternal life. Mark chapter 10. I can't help but think of a man uh, we'll close with this example that was shared by uh, uh, by a pastor by the name of David Livingston. David Livingston was a scholar. He studied Greek theology. He went to Glasgow University, graduated with a degree in medicine. He could have been anything that he wanted. He could have done anything that he wanted to be. He could have been a professor, an author, a doctor. But instead, God had saved him and God had called him to a mission field. In the course of time, God led him to Africa. Now, at, at the time that Livingston went to Africa, uh, at that time, this was years ago, no, no white man had ever entered into uh, interior Africa. Livingston was going to a place uh, deep in a part of Africa where no missionary had ever been seen. No gospel had been preached. No Christ had ever been shared. No salvation had ever been offered. The sacrifice he makes to do this work was incredible. While out in the bush preaching the gospel, one day a huge lion attacks him and clamps his teeth on his shoulder and crushes his shoulder and it leaves his arm completely useless. One of his helpers killed the lion and saved it. Through the ordeal, Livingston was nursed back to health by a woman named Mary, who later became his wife. She went with him to Africa. As the years passed, they had five children. While crossing one of those vast plains of Africa, one of the children died. They concluded that it would be safer for his wife and the other children to go back to Scotland. Livingston said that decision was the most difficult decision in his life talking about sacrifice. They left and for five years he did not see the faces of his wife and children and the loneliness was unbearable to him. Finally, the day came for Livingston to return home to his family where he got back to his house in Scotland, found it empty. His family had just buried his father, a godly man who he, he was very close to, he was heartbroken and another price had been paid. So he and his family enjoyed some time together, but after a while, he knew he had to go back to Africa. So at some point, he partnered, uh, again, he, he partnered company with his family, parted company. More years passed. Uh, finally, he received a letter that caused his heart to leap. The children were grown, and his wife was coming to join him. For months, he traveled across oceans and to steamy Africans. Uh, streams and rivers until finally she was in the arms of her husband. But she had barely arrived when she was struck down with a fever. Dr. Livingston used every ounce of his skills to save her, but he could not. He buried his wife under a huge African uh, boab tree. After having a short memorial service, he went back to his cottage and wept. He had made unbelievable sacrifice and he endured unbelievable burdens enough to crush many men. But listen to what he wrote that day in his diary. This is what he wrote. To Jesus my King, my life, my all, I'm going to again dedicate my whole self to you. I shall place no value on anything, possess or, or on anything, I do accept in relation to the kingdom of Christ. Through it all, the Lord sustained me. Sacrifice. After, listen to this. After 16 years in Africa, Livingston went to England for the first time. He became an international celebrity, which really he wasn't trying to do. He was invited to speak at a University of Glasgow where he had graduated for many years, from many years before. That was the custom of the day for, there was a custom for undergraduates to heckle the visiting speakers. So they were ready for this preacher to come in and they were going to, you know, blow their trumpets, uh, whistles, rattles, 
uh, noisemakers, they were going to heckle him, uh, as they've done in the past. They even had pea shooters. And when Livingston was in the Drews, something happened. They were all ready to make fun of him, to disrupt him, to laugh at him, and then they saw him. He came to the platform with a, you know, tread of a man who had already walked 11,000 miles. That left an arm hung uselessly on his side. His body was emaciated, his skin and dark brown form from 16 years in the African sun. His face was wrinkled, he ravages of several American fevers that had you know, racked up on his body. He was half deaf from rheumatic fever and half blind from a branch that had slipped and did damage to his eyes. Before he could even begin to speak, the students did something unheard of. They put their noisemakers down and they silently stood at their feet for respect of this man. Out of respect for him and God. They knew that who they were looking at was the epitome of sacrifice. Here was a life that had been sacrificed totally to God and totally for fellow men. Throughout Livingston's entire speech, not one of the students sat down and not one student said a word. Was the sacrifice worth it? 25 years after his death in 1900, there were 10 million Christians in Africa. Today, there are millions of Christians, but there's one thing. When Livingston died, the Lord Jesus greeted him standing at the gates of heaven and said without a doubt, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Jesus knows what we better learn. Jesus knows what we better learn. Nothing great ever done without him. Sacrifice. Any sacrifice for Jesus is always great. Dear God, we want to thank you so much for the time that we have together today. We give you thanks for the credit to the other guy for our lives. We pray for our brothers in Spanish. We want to leave our lives in your care, dear God. It's we believe that give it love our sacrifices. We were not sacrificing it. Pray God that you help us to analyze ourselves. We open up our mind and hearts to sacrifice and the cost of what it is to be inside. We pray God that you help us in our determination and our commitment.